been on the jury over the Infosys Science Foundation, looking, uh, being member of the jury of the Humanities and Social Science section. But uh, m uh, for particular relevance to us, he had spent a couple of months or almost a year working with us at NIMHANS, observing the working of NIMHANS. And he has a long interest in anthropology and social systems in South Asia. He's worked in Malaysia. He's worked on uh, the problems in tea plantations in Malaysia. The expatriate Tamil population has been working with tribals in the Nilgiris and has also been working with neurology and psychiatry in both in USA and India. So it, he offers a very different perspective and a unique perspective on the functioning of medical care systems. And over these several years that we've known each other, he spent time with Matthew Verge's OPD, with my, with our service, with the neurologists. So he has uh, fairly deep insights into the social structure of both symptoms, the illnesses, the syndromes, as well as the delivery systems. So it was great pleasure that I invite uh, Professor Andrew Wilford from Cornell. He has he'll you'll, his talk will tell you more about him thank you uh, extra microphone and thank you uh, Sanjeev um, and thank you all for coming it's a real uh, pleasure to come back to Nimhans and to see old friends and to meet new friends and uh, colleagues and you know it, it's just such an honor to be in such an important institution um, I want to thank the Infosys Science Foundation in particular for helping sponsor this uh, talk and making it possible. In particular, I'd like to single out Bhavna Mehta, Swati Revankar, and Gurpreet Wala, who are, uh, well, two of them are here today, um, who really helped facilitate all of this. Um, I want to give special thanks to Sanjeev, Dr. Sanjeev and Dr. Matthew, uh, who were mentors to me and so I'm a little bit nervous to present back to them. Uh, it's a little bit crazy to speak, a little bit odd to speak to one's research subjects and they were my research teachers but also my subjects so they will hear in a sort of uncanny way, they will hear their own thoughts being echoed back to them through the filter of an American anthropologist. So it's a very strange thing for them to be sitting here and having to listen to me captive like this. But for me it's a great honor and privilege and also an important opportunity uh, to talk about this work because I'm preparing a book manuscript on this. And so this is the first chance that I've had to present this work to my colleagues here. And so any sort of feedback and, I, and thoughts and questions will be very helpful as I work towards finalizing this manuscript. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, my own work. Um, as Dr. Sanjeev mentioned, I've worked in the Nilgiris. I've worked uh, in other parts of, of Southeast Asia and Malaysia in particular. I've done some work in Bangalore itself uh, on language politics. Um, one common thread that ties all of my work together is a concern with identity and when it becomes excessive and even borderline a kind of pathological attachment to an identity. And so I've always been interested in what are the political and social circumstances that help produce a tenacious hold of identity in ways that divide people from each other. Um, so that's sort of a, a theme that I'm going to be talking a little bit about today in the work that I'm going to present. Um, overall, however, um, I've been focused in, in this particular book project, and I'll see if I pull up the outline just so you have a sense what, I, what the, whole, the whole project is about. Um, I've been really focused, at least in the Nimhans part of the book, which is chapters one through six, on stigma, normalization, uh, and the, I, the sort of themes around stigma and the ability to uh, address stigma clinically and also socially, uh, but then how that inhibits access to care uh, and the forces that also then try to make people normal in order to remedy that stigma. I've been very interested in care versus abandonment, and it's not a simple dichotomy. It's always much more complicated and nuanced, I learned, being here for one year. Um, social intimacies and connectivities are very rich, and so to talk about care and abandonment, we have to be careful we don't fall into dichotomies. That's sort of another general theme in my work, is to try to avoid and break through dichotomies. Um, clinical dichotomies, ethnic dichotomies, nationalist dichotomies, religious dichotomies, all sorts of dichotomies are, are problematic for a number of reasons. We need to open up a space uh, between these dichotomies. Um, but the th uh, oh, third point, resistance and rebellion, uh, is something that I paid a lot of attention to 
And these themes, all of these themes that I paid attention to uh, came about because of the way I took notes as a silent observer for the most part, although I would speak to the physicians and, and residents. Uh, I didn't interact with the patients. So my methodology was a little bit unusual in that I was a shadow, but then I had interlocutors who were professionals here at NIMHANS. I wasn't doing life histories. I wasn't going home with uh, a patient and finding out etiology of their illness and so on and so forth. So there wasn't that kind of depth. It was more about breadth. And with that, I was able to sort of tabulate almost numerically what were the predominant themes that emerged from a year of observing the OPD and even the halls of NIMHANS. And so these were the themes that really struck me as very prevalent. Shame and stigma, issues of rebellion and abandonment, malevolence and modernity, anxiety and burnout, the IT burnout that you're all uh, aware of and tension and so on and so forth. Um, and then I focus somewhat on neurology and in particular I was interested in seizure disorders and the boundary between the psychogenic seizure or the pseudo seizure and the non pseudo seizure or the epileptic seizure. I'm going to focus today more on the phantasms of modernity chapter, but I'm going to try to touch on the broader themes that are there in the first five chapters. But the, the main emphasis will be on malevolence and modernity. We all know about a sense of crisis, and I'm, I'm now going into the paper, which is a bit long. I'll try to read fast. Um, we all hear about this sense of there's a mental health crisis in India. We just saw something in The Guardian a, a week ago uh, speaking to this, and there have been numerous media stories. But that sense of crisis has focused on expanding coverage and edu educating the public about the potentials for increased risks of illness and in times of increasing stress as well as the need to combat stigma associated with mental illness. And the key debates in the media and academy have taken as given the preponderance of mental illness as both statistically underreported and as the need for an expanded reach of biomedical care, particularly biomedical psychiatric care. But the question of just how stigma produces its pathological object, the mentally ill patient, requires an opening up of the cultural and social forces that in the name of normalizing and harmonizing relation, relationships also enact regimes of power, oftentimes gendered, and quell creative and rebellious resistances to these hierarchy enacting forces. How modern psychiatric clinical practice fits into or resists the violence of producing the normal moral subject is the, que is the question that I attempt to address in this larger book project. And that has a tribal perspective and this urban perspective. So the idea is to look from the top down from a major research center, NIMHANS, and then from sort of the bottom up in an area that's very underserved by biomedical care. The ranges of stigma, rebellion, uh, these slides, by the way, have no real great significance to you because you see this every day, but imagine I'm giving this talk to an American audience. Uh, the ranges of stigma, rebellion, and pathology versus normalcy within the NIMHANS clinical context are vast and varied, given the status as a major tertiary center. But NIMHANS draws patients from all over the country due to its reputation, affordability, and relatively well-connected location within Bangalore. Hundreds of patients pass through the outpatient department each day with a myriad of illness presentations. These patterns are both a function of the cultural and social shaping of illnesses within families and communities, as well as the clinical modalities shaped by the physicians at NIMHANS who struggle oftentimes valiantly, very valiantly I would add, against the pressures of high patient loads, coupled with the need to mitigate symptoms, indeed normalize and harmonize patients within their families and communities. In the multitude of cases, the acute nature of the illness and the social violence that might have been its primary symptom, and perhaps in some cases, its traumatic cause, the ideal of patient insight was sometimes buried under the weight of urgency and the need to offer only a salve to deeper structural problems. Symptoms that led to abuse perpetrated by the patient or its reverse as caused by the social context in which the patient was traumatized were subject to biomedical interventions. This moreover demonstrated to me that the romantic constructivist view of mental illness as protest or simply labeling of power, that is the thinking of power, Foucault comes to mind, that proved inadequate in addressing the acute and very palpable suffering patients and their families endured as a result of the illness. The hot season, April, May, had Nimhan slowing down a little bit. Though hundreds of patients continued to flow through the OPD each day, the bodies, however, seemed to move in a more languid fashion now, in the full heat of May having arrived. One could see patients and their families huddling in the shade of the Verdant campus, which is so lovely, as we all know. 
um, cobras or no cobras. The examination rooms and halls of the OPD did not have air conditioning, though the normally swooshing ceiling fans moved at their fastest setting, requiring all paperwork to be held down by paperweights. The sound of fans drowned out voices, making it a bit harder to hear within the examination rooms, though it also had the effect of drowning out noises from the hallways and waiting rooms, which was welcome. Doctors and patients had to speak a bit louder, but there were many instances when hearing did prove difficult and the fans would be turned off. Usually advice was immediate and geared towards behavioral modifications that were thought to be healthy for the patient, given their particular distress. For example, a person who would spend too much time on the computer or TV would be advised to keep themselves occupied with other activities. Or a person prone to depression or schizophrenia might be advised to have a might be advised to have a daily structured schedule, leaving less room for rumination, and apparently delusions to harden and take hold of the mind. Diaries were not encouraged among those with severe delusions or hallucinations. Family issues might be hinted at, but probing in great depth was rarely witnessed in the OPD. Sometimes the doctors, however, would ruminate or speculate further on the psychosocial and cultural dimensions of their patients they were treating once the patients had left the room, maybe for my benefit. Mental illness was, whatever its biological and neurological underpinnings, influenced by social patterns, bringing the violence of the social into the causative formation of symptoms. These oftentimes involved gendered norms that coerced a kind of normalization within the family and social, inducing symptoms of protest or resistance, which in turn were then partially normalized within the clinical context through the desired cure offered by the medications. But the doctors, though varied in style, often resisted patient or familial desires for a kind of normalcy that suppressed these symptoms, but did not get to their provenance in social violence. And when I mean social violence, I don't mean necessarily beating. I mean the sort of general structural uh, oppressions that might be existent within the family and the community. Factors such as the patrilocal joint family, the tensions caused by the increasingly competitive forces of education and labor, and the increasing legalism or literalism that are both symptomatic of a more bureaucratized society, as well as the causal, causal force of today's demands upon identity and self-worth, have to some extent exacerbated the shame surrounding mental illness. The venue of the OPD with its heavy patient loads and limited clinical durations focused upon symptom alleviation, despite doctors harboring more complicated understandings of case histories and illness presentations than they were able to effectively treat. And this they would lament to me often. Shame and stigma, however, in most cases, did not lead families to reject the person possessing the illness. Rather, conflicts that were difficult and strained family relationships seldom led to the abandonment or institutionalizing of the afflicted. The lives of patients and their families were entangled in complicated ways, both in terms of the etiology of illnesses, that is the psychosocial causative factors, and their attempts at resolution. When thinking about psychic resistance, we can recall that to Freud, the symptom always resists against the disclosure of the psychic tension that prompted it. Therefore, there is much resistance the closer one approaches the scene of trauma, division, and tension. Repetitive and compulsive be behavior can be, even in masochistic displays, a form of resistance against the normative order, as, it seems to, as much as it seems to be a resistance without resistance or a subjection to this order through its ostensible and relentless punitive face. As Derrida notes in his resistances to psychoanalysis, quote, the repetition compulsion, hyperbolic resistance of non-resistance is in itself analytic in the surest form of its ruse disguised as non-resistance. So masochism as a kind of non-resistance is actually a kind of resistance. And for Deleuze, another French philosopher, acts of resistance can be creative disart disarticulation of the arboreal or structured ordering of things, a defiant and creative impulse. But to Derrida, resistance marks the edge of intelligibility and meaning, which in turn also indexes a suffering and division that cannot be aestheticized without violence. But sometimes rebellion or resistance as an explanation was not countered, contradicted, or even denied. There were numerous cases of addiction, particu particularly substance abuse of alcohol and ganja, that passed through the halls of Nimhans. Oftentimes, these were working class males who used substances to cope with the pressures of making ends meet. 
working in arduous and physically demanding jobs or even due to peer pressure. But in other cases, particularly among the young and more affluent, addictive behaviors could be a mark of rebellion against the normative order or even a mark of boredom and fatigue with the increasingly, with the increasingly pace of life uh, in the urban metropolis. But resistance took other more dramatic refractory and somatic forms as well. Anxiety over familial expectations was a common thread that tied discussions about normalization to the inherent vice grip embedded within kinship. These often figured around gendered forms of hierarchy. Farida, I'm going to give some case studies now. These are all pseudonyms, by the way, so this is not the real person. Farida, a woman from West Bengal, came to the OPD complaining of heart and chest tightness, also describing a feeling of heaviness and loss of appetite. Farida had very difficult fights with her husband's family after moving into the family's house after marriage, and for 20 years had faced escalating tension with her mother and sisters-in-law. Her primary symptom was morning anxiety that was most acute when the day began. As the day progressed, the anxiety would lessen. Let's skip ahead a little bit to the OPD, since that's what we're now we'll be talking about. Farida ruminated constantly about the quarrels she was having with her husband, who failed to support her when she was being criticized by in-laws. The couple had one child. While the husband was talking, I noticed Farida becoming progressively more anxious. Aside from her anxiety, which was causing her to have panic attacks, complete with palpitations and loss of appetite, she had become very irritable, according to the husband. She also, he said, had occasional thoughts of suicide or had at least threatened it. Farida had no previous known psychiatric issues. Her son was 18 and was their only child. She had three sisters. Due to the severe marital discord, she had moved back into her natal home two months earlier prior to being seen at Nimhans. This was an extreme step, the husband complained, given that the family was not in a position to support her. Not to mention the apparent stigma attached to moving back into the mother's house and out of a difficult marital context. The doctor asked Farida, quote, how did this go on for 20 years? And what was changed in the last two months that prompted you to move out? End quote. This was followed with a question as to whether the brothers and sisters married after her. Here I assumed he was talking about, the doctor was talking about the sisters within the in-law's family, where the dynamic would alter the in-house hierarchy between the daughters-in-law. In any event, no answers were forthcoming from Farida, but she did indicate that the panic symptoms were much worse in recent times. Something apparently had become acute and unbearable. One might wonder if the family conflict had made Farida mad. Perhaps the doctor was also thinking this because his next question, in fact, was, quote, were you able to handle the daughter-in-law duties, end quote? Nothing was said in response. A palpable tension and silence between spouses seemed to inhibit Farida's response. The doctor suggested that family therapy was needed, given the core familial tension. But the willingness to undertake therapy was doubtful. The husband said he was only interested in making Farida compliant to her role in the family through medication. This was a prototypical case of the joint family in dysfunction, with the daughter-in-law bearing the brunt of the tension, being the least powerful person in the household. I'm sure very familiar to all of you. Farida's resistance, insofar as her symptoms of fainting and anxiety brought to attention her pain, was delimited by the social and moral. Moreover, it was her refuge in her natal home, which was intolerable and shameful, requiring the expertise at Nimhans. But having received the advice of admission for therapy, and therapy, it was clear that understanding the provenance of Farida's anxiety, irritability, and fainting were not considered as important as was the disciplinary hope that drug-induced induced compliance promised, at least to the husband. When I witnessed cases like this, I wondered why patients and their families would travel vast distances to Nimhans only to be sent back home with a referral to a local psychiatrist, a short flight, who through a, I'm sorry, uh, connection to a local psychiatrist who, through a connection to Nimhans, was thought to be reliable. With wealthy patients, a short flight to Bangalore was indeed feasible, but many patients would make long multi-day journeys by train or bus only to stay at Nimhans for a day or two. The question I had, as exemplified by Farida's case, was what did they expect this visit to Nimhans to accomplish? Without an extended stay in intensive family therapy, what could be accomplished in one session? Again, the implication was that the husband and in-laws were hoping for a quick pharmaceutical fix. Sad cases like this would pass through the OPD each day, leaving the doctors exasperated, or at the very least feeling resigned to the limits of care that were imposed upon them by time and social stigma.
A modern symptom, particularly relevant within excessive attachments to ethnicity, religion, and nation, is to divide the world into absolutes in which betrayal is a common theme, as is the dualistic, almost Manichaean struggle between good and evil and the concomitant inability to live within the gray zones of ambiguity where the battle lines are not so starkly drawn between self and other, good and evil, and the sociocultural categories that in their hypostasized and serialized form wedge communities and individuals against one another. In one sense, these dualities and their pernicious othering tendencies are symptomatic of the modernist and serial imagination that demands corporate identifications, homogenized, serialized, corporate, official identities. But in another sense, I would suggest that the inst instantiation of these bounded forms of identity are themselves productive of the symptoms of othering. Moreover, the madness potentially unleashed by totalizing and ossified forms of identification when conjoined to underlying symptoms, be they psychosocial or organic, intensifies the conditions of betrayal and cosmological suggestibility, providing for and exacerbating the content of the repertoire of symptoms that are compelled to speak in the name of the law or archive of truth that supplements a deficient reality. This ossifying social field, this hardening social field in turn is productive of obsessions and delusions that shape an already existent symptomatology in new and more bounded forms. As a consequence, the prevalent themes of betrayal and categorical truth, as opposed to a toleration of ambiguity and uncertainty, take root in accusations and uncanny hauntings, as well as in a kind of legalist subjectivity that is supplemented through the fevered archives of the other's transgressions. A 30-year-old and slightly overweight woman, let us call her Salma, came with her husband and young son to the outpatient department. The woman had a visible scab on her forehead caused by hitting her head against the wall. It seems that she was unaware at the time that she was doing this until the blood would flow. Upon seeing blood, she would cease the head banging. She came from a lower middle class background. It was only after marriage and childbirth that the depressive episodes had exhibited these seizure-like behaviors. The husband was a second-hand tailor who earned a very modest wage. The woman had, in fact, moved socially downward in terms of material wealth after her marriage. The doctor treating her thought out loud to me privately after the patient had left the room that economic frustration could indeed be a factor in her illness. Prior to coming to Nimhans, she had visited two dargas. One darga, however, for a Sufi saint, whereas the other was for a more reformist Wahhabi-influenced saint. While both suggested she was possessed by devils, their prescribed cures were different. Within the Sufi, with the Sufi priest, she had been told in the course of her treatment that she possessed a jinn and um, drank a whole bottle of rum in which had been demanded by the jinn in the presence of this peer or spiritual healer within this darga. She had never had alcohol before, we were told by the husband. And this did not appease the jinn, evidently, or cure her of her madness. The Wahhabi influence healer in the other darga discouraged this behavior and wanted her to follow the orthodox teachings in order to drive the devil out. This also did not work. When both failed, she decided to try neurology and eventually was transferred to psychiatry at Nimhans. The physicians examining her deduced her behavior to be volitional and communicative. If epileptic seizures were occurring, they would not fall into a pattern of self-injury in the manner as presented. Moreover, she would not be able to stop her head banging upon seeing blood. The woman's appearance was sluggish, depressive, and somewhat uninterested in the doctor's evaluation, while her husband showed visible concern. The patient was described as, quote, a 30-year-old mother of two suffered from a compulsion to bang her head, end quote. She, now a working-class woman, experienced, quote, economic distress as well as social marginality, end quote. Discord, especially with her in-laws, had worsened over time, making her very sensitive to their criticism. She, as mentioned, had been more autonomous prior to the marriage and more liberal in her practice of Islam, which not uncommon in India was sprinkled with Hindu and Sufi elements. Moreover, she had worked as a hairdresser prior to marriage and the family saw her now as a bad Muslim woman. On the other hand, having themselves embraced a reformed or purified Islam. Her father, a Sunni, had not been as strict as her, as her in-laws and husband. Religious tensions were playing out in the family indicative, as the doctor suggested to me, of a wider canvas of religious tension in the country. Being caught within models was a cultural strain that worsened the symptoms of many female patients as their freedoms and aspirations were increasingly frustrated after marriage. This wasn't unique to Muslims, it was all communities. 
Her primary symptom of head banging had left a large scar on her forehead. While banging her head, she said she feels alive. Sometimes her husband said she presents with hemiparalysis as well. Her paralysis was psychogenic, according to the doctors who had examined her. Sometimes while banging her head during a seizure, she would speak in the voices of other people who are, quote, not me. She had earlier visited the Sufi Oriana Darga, specializing in demonology and exorcism, and was found to be possessed by this evil jinn. The jinn was originally thought to be the spirit of a 16-year-old girl who had committed suicide. But sometimes the jinn spoke as if he was a deceased brother of the woman calling attention to a murder that had occurred. The 16-year-old woman evidently had been murdered, or someone else close to the brother had been murdered. It was a bit murky. The jinn, however, spoke from beyond the grave, in short, to an injustice that had occurred. This empowered Salma, making her feel alive by allowing her to be an arbiter of justice, or at least its siren, from beyond the walls of death. We might even speculate that the traces of death within her, a renounced self, with its aspirations for life, an ambivalence towards the letter of the law as opposed to the living or organic flow of a richer religious life, and the repetitive and seizure-like self-harm that marked her alien and uncanny to her in-laws were concretized and externalized through the figure of the jinn, leaving her inner being alive, if only for a moment of possession. In those moments, she commanded care and fear, not unlike the figure of the goddess in much South Asian thought. Aside from frightening her family, she received attention and a degree of support, though it must have been also ambivalent given the family's more orthodox orientation. Her symptom and its treatment called attention to the clashing cultural models at play, but beyond the cultural context, which were also marked by socioeconomic strain, why did the women identify and find some degree of enlivening pleasure with the symptom of the jinn possession, particularly given the familial disapproval of this, and therefore its invitation to create more discord within the family. And why the emphasis on murder? Why a 16-year-old girl? Was this woman around this age when she married? Was her injustice within the husband's family tantamount to a kind of murder? I couldn't find the answer to those questions, uh, but they just struck me as very interesting ones to ponder. Even the doctors often admitted that their speculations of psychosocial causation were tantalizing and possibly useful for determining the level of biomedical intervention prescribed. They were never resolved to their satisfaction, however. Moreover, they were not often in a, not in a position to convince patients that psychotherapy might be warranted given the patient preference for the magical tablet for symptomatic relief. Still, this case, like many other similar cases of malevolent haunting, frustration, and thwarted aspirations, seem to suggest an emergent pattern of response to reformist pressures and the categorical truths they purport, as well as the psychological consequence thereof. The hemiparalysis and hurting oneself also suggests a kind of inward-directed aggression that cannot find an external target, which, must, which might suggest that the failure of exorcism looms large. Again, this also accords with Sudhir Kakar's model of paralysis and self-harm through malevolent spirit possession as a means to defend against the greater horrors of being unfilial. The doctors at Nimhans were also social analysts, are social analysts, and were increasingly wary of the growing trends towards policing, social, and religious boundaries in a nation that, in their words, prided itself on inclusivity and religious pluralism. Quote, reforms led to feelings of betrayal and absolutism, which in turn exacerbated paranoid symptoms while also delimiting the range of therapies, particularly within the traditional spheres of faith healing that were more freely available in the past. This absolutism arising from reforms, we might also note, worsened stigma by turning formerly permissible expressions of psychosocial stress into bad or evil practices at odds with the increasingly proscribed forms of religious and somatic expression of symptoms. One might even say that the gods and demons are now more judgmental. Modernity, as Deleuze might say, had deterritorialized and re-territorialized the more protean deities into more moralistic and rigid entities, disseminating their malevolence in so doing. If Obia Sacra, an anthropologist of South Asia, is correct, and I suspect he is, public meaning systems are not only intellectual webs of meaning, but also, in part, projected fantasies out of unconscious traumas, forbidden wishes and desires, or punitive objectifications of subjective experiences of ambivalence. <clears throat> 
This then means that any individual's personal symbol, though drawn from a more collective set of meanings, is also invariably different, even in its repetition of the same principles. Here are the psychodynamic models of Freud meet the organic model of life as difference, out of the repetition as conceptualized by Deleuze in his reading of Nietzsche. But while this might be a productive line of inquiry in order to find proximity, yet variation between the traces of trauma and public meaning systems, such as those of a preta, jinn, pei, other ghostly presences, this affirmation of life as repetition out of difference does not do justice to the painful urgency of the symptom, whereby repetition is not marked so much by the production of life than an intimacy with death. If death's door, so to speak, can only be closed by repeated slamming, but always remains ajar, where is there room for the subject or self to be open to a future undetermined by the past? This is an idea we must ponder when considering more romantic ideas of resistance up against the suspension and endurance of pain that these resistances often produce in paralyzing refractions. Some Nimhan's doctors felt that the psychiatrists today were not being trained enough in cultural psychology and that increased specialization conjoined to an institutional insecurity made doctors less interested in the whole social and cultural context of human experience in favor of the more easily measurable kinds of evidence. So the senior doctors are looking now or thinking now about the juniors and uh, complaining about how in my day it was better. Our conversations often turn to the problem of, cult of cultural attenuation more broadly under the guise of religious reform that, rich, that a rich tapestry of a cultural fluidity exists but against this reality, the modernist and reformist discourses of moral and religious boundaries and totalizing notions of right and wrong as grafted upon a homogenized form was an, was an alarming trend that was exacerbating underlying psychiatric vulnerabilities and conditions. Fundamentalisms and identity fixations often went hand in hand and were based often enough on the invented or constructed categories of community that were once used for, ironically, colonial governance. Significantly, and along these lines, I was told about numerous examples in which the slightest insults were taken as cosmological, unforgivable, therefore increasingly polarizing between religious and ethnic boundaries. Vasanti was a young working class woman in her early 20s from Tamil Nadu. She was accompanied by her father to the clinic. Her primary complaint was of black magic, sevene, being done to her. She heard voices that caused her to, quote, break things around the house. Vasanti also complained that her thoughts were, quote, heard by others. Her father described, which with Vasanti interjecting with added details, that the symptoms began after a dog had bitten her, causing her to fall, injuring her head. After this head injury, she suffered from fits, seizures. The doctor asked whether a CT scan had been done to check for brain injury. The, the father replied that none had been done. At this point, the doctor sighed and began to ask about her symptoms. Her father listened to her main, I'm sorry, her father listed her main symptoms as fearfulness, loneliness, and headaches, coupled with an intense suspicion of others. Fasanti sat passively without disagreeing or nodding assent. In terms of cognitive function, her reaction to verbal conversation seemed reduced, according to the father, and she began to fail her school exams. Vasanti called it a demotivation failure. The father nodded as she said the word demotivation in English, which stood apart from the Tamil language that was being spoken. Things had taken a turn for the worse in the last six months, according to the father, when she refused to his order that he work, that she work, sorry. There were loud quarrels in the house between the father and the mother, and more recently between a frustrated father and Vasanti. She said, however, that black magic was, quote, being done by the downstairs neighbors, unquote, causing her, quote, disturbances and anger, making her break objects, refuse work, and quarrel. The family conducted rituals to combat the Savané, and she had been treated with olanzapine and antipsychotic medication at some point. This was not her first encounter with psychiatry. In many cases, patients combined faith healing with psychiatry, so there was nothing unusual in this. Moreover, there was a family history of mental illness. Her mother, we were told, had been treated at Nimhans for the same symptoms years earlier. The question that jumped into my curious mind at the time was whether Vasanti's symptoms were in fact modeled after her mother's behavior, particularly in light of the troubling tension and quarrels that Vasanti noted between her parents. Was she identifying with her mother? Indeed, the doctor 
Next asked about work and family life, trying to elicit more information about these dynamics. A series of short questions and answers followed in rapid succession. Doctor, do you enjoy shopping? Patient, I go with my mother. Doctor, does she help? What does she cook? Patient, sambar and rasam. Doctor, do you like mother's food? Patient, meh. Doctor, what films do you like to watch? Patient, Rajinikant. That's no surprise, right? Uh, doctor, what do you enjoy doing? Patient, cleaning house. Doctor, describe Savane. Patient, this is black magic. Doctor, how do you know they wish harm? Patient, I was told in the temple that I'd been the victim of Savane. I'm a regular temple visitor. Doctor, how do you know whom you can trust? Patient, I have faith. Nambike. Doctor, do you hear voices? How do they sound? How do you hear them and what do they say? Are they male or female? Patient, both male and female voices come. Doctor, do you hear the same voices each time or are they different? Patient, they are different each time. Doctor, when you listen to the radio, do you hear them still? This is a great clinical interview for those medical students. Doctor, when you listen to the radio, do you hear them still? Patient, no. Doctor, so you hear them when alone? Patient, yes, while I'm alone. Doctor, do they interfere with you when you are speaking to another? Patient, no. Doctor, what are they saying? Patient, they are commenting on my thoughts. Doctor, what do they say about your thoughts? Patient, no response, slight pause. Then, I confronted the downstairs neighbor, but they deny any doings of Savane. Doctor, are they lying? Patient, nambikele. I don't tr believe them. I don't trust them. But there's nothing to do in a sevadu about them. What are they saying? Doctor says. Patient, whatever I think, they speak, but not in my own voice. Aside from her delusion of thought transmission that was so clearly enunciated was Vasanti's sense of doubling. The voices were her, but not her. They amplified her thoughts, but in a voice uncanny and alien, coming from the neighbors, close to home, but slightly ajar. That door is ajar. Vasanti felt an overwhelming sense of something uninterpretable, a presence that is clearly both her and not her, but doesn't say anything definite other than speaking her thoughts in a foreign tongue, in a manner of speaking. An entity that is not quite oneself, but is an overwhelming presence, caused Vasanti to slow down, become agitated, and to some extent an automaton, or an enactment of a kind of living death, reacting to and perhaps interpolated by the other's desire. Family dynamics were clearly an important part of the equation, though much remained implicit in the clinical interview. This retreat from normalcy, however, we might be tempted to frame, we might be tempted to frame it as resistance to patriarchy or to the arbitrariness of the law. This retreat from normalcy, however, is never without pain, alienation, and increased social strain. Vasanti's case, of course, like all the other cases I witnessed, had its idiosyncras idiosyncrasies and questions surrounding underlying organic conditions, which is to say illness presentations were shaped, but not wholly determined by so psychosocial stress factors or cultural belief systems. The doctor's final questions were addressed to these organic concerns. Doctor, addressing the father now, was physical growth okay? Was she thin or short for her age? Father, a bit less than other kids. Doctor, did she get her period at the age of 12? Father, not sure, but I think so. Doctor, what has been her response the past few years? Any sadness or suicide wishes? Was she consistently sad for several days? Father, she wasn't so depressed, but did sleep excessively. Doctor, what about the breaking of things? Why did she do this? Father, I have no, I, I have no idea or understanding. Purile, terile. Are the voices telling her to do this? No. Do you have a BPL card? Patient, mother, and the father both say nothing, and the father answers no. It was explained that the father, by the father, the family was facing financial hardships. The father was a factory worker, but the factory where he worked had been shut down. They were from Hosur, within Tamil Nadu, on the border here. Uh, you know where it is, I don't need to tell you. Um, depending on traffic, it's an hour or so away. 
Uh, that's being generous, I suppose. Coming there was not a huge hardship, however, for the family. This notwithstanding, the financial stress within the family undoubtedly contributed to the tensions and worries. And we can probably surmise that the daughter's refusal to work and the quarrels it caused with her father were intensified by the financial need in the wake of, this, of his unemployment. In this sense, even if, it was, even if it was something Vasanti lacked insight into, the predicament of industrialized labor and her father's precarity within it had in turn influenced the malevolence, malevolence and savony she experienced. The not her that spoke through her might have been an indirect means of dealing with the everyday violence of the social, in this case, economic insecurity, and her failures to contribute to the financial security of the family due to her cognitive limitations. Modernity's discontents were framed in terms of dark forces and betrayed or thwarted aspirations. The doctor was concerned that the father understand Vasanti's likely cognitive limitations noted that she possessed slight physical abnormalities. Her stature was quite slight, and she might have possessed slight um, what he called mongoloid features. Um, and so there was some suspicion of maybe a Down syndrome-like syn uh, uh, disorder. I don't remember if that was asked in the clinic or if that came up later, but I can ask the doctor later. He asked of the father that the family do some genetic screening to see if anything turned up. Of course, finding genetic markers could be very useful for patient treatment in some cases, so testing was often done, in addition to the functional treatment of illnesses. In this case, I suspected that the doctor was trying to communicate to the father that their aspirations could and should be tempered by an organic understanding of Vasanti's limitations. And moreover, this also an indirect way to, and this is important, to defetishize the resonance of Savané beliefs with their sometimes pernicious effects on patient accountability. That is, while sorcery or possession could be indirect idioms of speaking to distress without, indirectly, without directly accusing family or other intimates of moral transgressions and ambivalent emotions, that's how it might function on the one hand, the body, so to speak, is able to speak through its symptoms in ways that the voice could not given that the law must be obeyed, that the patient's truth must remain uns unspoken. But failed exorcisms could redouble stigma rather than lessening it, leaving the patient facing the double jeopardy of lingering, troublesome, and unacceptable symptoms on the one hand, and on the other hand, the failed morality um, of the person who cannot or does not deserve to find relief of the malevolent forces that claim them. This subtle and deliberate intervention on the doctor's part struck me as very skillful and practiced, given many years of practice and knowledge of the comorbid and complex interplay of psychosocial, cosmological, bioorganic variables as they impacted upon each patient. And given the time constrictions of the OPD, doctors had to be practical and offer poignant, though fairly terse, advice to patients and their families. In this case, he was obviously cognizant of the deeply rooted culture and yet very personal sense of Vasanti's predicament and illness presentation. But in the end, the organic and practical were designed, I felt, to cut like a knife against the cloud of uncertainty that emerged in the dialogue. Recall that many of the answers he received to the questions, the direct questions, were simply no or expressed a complete lack of understanding. While extended family and psychotherapy, particularly of the psycho, so, psycho, so, sorry, psychodynamic kind, might have unpacked and deconstructed the affect of generalized suspicion and dark forces, particularly as family dynamics were better understood, he focused on more modest but likely more feasible interventions. This, in practical terms, was to reduce the dose of olanzapine um, from 20 to a slight, 20 mg's to a slightly lower dose, in hopes that this would make her less lethargic, sleepy, and slow. In other words, address the cognitive as aspect uh, in her ability to respond to others. He also advised the family to increase Vasanti's physical activities and encouraged that she help her mother around the house. Her social skills had to be cultivated too, he urged the father. It'll be recalled that she did not hear the voices when talking with others. These voices were her own thoughts, now verbalized from an elsewhere, 
But excessive rumination, which clearly in this case was harmful, could be circumvented through a more active and socially interactive life. Finally, it'll be recalled too that her own thoughts could be heard by others, which thus is symptomatically symmetrical to the voices being her own thoughts. There's a structural parallel here. In either case, she didn't trust her own thoughts as they were infected by the others overhearing. Hypostasization and materialization through vocalization back to herself. It was quite an interesting case. One final case. Um, just some more, oops, uh, scenes that you see every day. Ramesh, a young man in his 20s, came with his mother to the OPD. He was articulate, talkative, and inquisitive. Ramesh asked me where I was from, and generally when patients would talk to me, I would respond, but I didn't try to engage them because I felt that wasn't my role. But I would definitely answer if asked a question. He asked where I was from, and when I said the US, he mentioned that he had lived there for five years. Boldly, I thought at the time, he immediately stated that Americans were much better behaved outwardly than Indians were. He had never met Donald Trump, obviously. <laughs> um, Indians, Rama said, would cut the queue and not follow the rules. But Indians would not hurt the heart, though their outward behavior was rude. This was his assertion. That his outward behavior and inward intentions were not always aligned or transparent, he suggested. The relevance of this statement only became clear a bit later. Ramesh's doctor made some general inquiries as to how he was doing as he was returning on a follow-up from an earlier treatment. His mother complained about his compulsions, that was the word she used, which to her seemed unreasonable. Ramas would counter with statements that were disparaging and sharply critical of her. He told his doctor that he was, quote, studying Tamil and law online and found these things interesting. It seems he had felt cheated in the family business by his employees and was learning the law to deal with this. The doctor in turn inquired whether it was really necessary to go to these lengths to deal with minor cheaters in the workplace. Moreover, Ramas seemed to connect seemingly unrelated phenomena, such as the need to study law depth with small-scale cheating of some employees who were skimming a bit of profit on the family business. His study of Tamil, on the other hand, came, it was revealed by Ramesh, with an intense devotion to mastering some old religious texts and his desire to go deep into Vaishnavism through its literature. The doctor asked Ramesh and his mother whether his acts were, quote, impulsive or well thought out, end quote. He asked further whether he made all his decisions alone or took family account I'm sorry, whether he made his decisions alone or took account of what others thought or did. In so doing, he emphasized that some semblance of family harmony was essential. It was becoming clear to me that he had a history of being combative with his mother and father. The mother exclaimed that Ramesh had told his father that he was, quote, just waiting for him to die, end quote. When the father asked how he could speak to anyone like this, much less his own father, Ramesh answered that as, quote, everyone is going to die, it is not anything wrong, end quote. <coughs> there was reasoning in this as he invoked Indian philosophical notions of transience. In this context, however, this seemed less pious and, at least to the mother and doctor, hollow and cruel. It also came across, I felt at the time, as arrogant. The doctor explained that it was important that he learn to have close friends and family bonds. Ramesh replied, quote, Guruji is close to me, end quote. This was in reference to having a close confidant to discuss problems with. But his doctor tried to explain that Guruji was different, as he was a guide but not a close confidant, fa friend, or family member. Ramas countered, saying that, in fact, his guru was very close to him and cared for him intensely. Therefore, he could discuss anything with him. The doctor worried that his frames of reference seemed to come from a rigorous, if not overly legalistic, mindset. While the literal father, the biological father, had flaws, his spiritual father was perfect, all-knowing, wise, and loving. People more generally were untrustworthy and could compromise his sense of self. There was indeed hyper-vigilance regarding his own ego. This manifested in being overly critical of others as well as taking offense very easily. In men, he would always search for the flaw in the other with legalistic zeal, 
Well, my first impression was that Ramesh might not be psychotic. He had, in fact, elaborate delusions and a psychosis that was fairly well controlled with medications. At one point, I learned later, he, had, he felt that the massive Howrah station in Calcutta was an elaborate set that was made to watch and observe him, like the Truman Show. But to understand his personal ideolo ideology to some extent, his unhappy life in the US as a student is critical. Ramesh was quite brilliant and gone to study at a major research university in New York as a mathematics and physics PhD student. But while studying in the US, an undercover FBI informant had entrapped him by offering to help him get a fake ID. Ramesh had hoped that this with this counterfeit ID, it was not clear whether he knew it was fake or not, he could stay on and work at the university library after his graduation. While he was caught in this dragnet, he was forced to leave the country, but not before he was arrested and put in a jail. When a local district attorney and his appointed lawyer, however, saw how he had been set up, and also that he was not on any list of terror subjects or was no criminal record, he was released and charges were dropped, provided he leave the country. Therefore, he came back to India. But understandably, he became more distrustful of others after this subterfuge. It was not known whether he had already suffered extensive delusions or paranoia prior to this event. At least I didn't know. Regarding his religiously orthodox and legalistic interpretations, it seems Ramesh followed astrological beliefs and calculations to the letter and number, and believe that the stories about Lord Krishna, for example, when he lifted the mountain to save the village, are actual historical events. His obsessiveness about religious ideas translated also into his handling of the family business, where he prosecuted all and anybody who would even so slightly cheat on the factory floor. The slightest infractions incurred his wrath. In a sense, Ramesh appeared to be a neurotic rather than a psychotic, at least in the sort of Freudian or Lacanian understanding, having internalized and fully identified with the symbolic figure of the law, the father figure. That is, his absolutism was absolute. Truth was unambiguous and literal. His sense of the law or truth was not tempered with reflexivity and appreci appreciation of gray zones or indeterminacy or even conscience. Rather, it was almost me mechanistic, machine-like reality that he grasped in order to structure his life. This was legalism wedded to grandiosity, fueled by the rage of betrayal, and an overlaid with cosmic significance. His grandiosity was also fuel fueled, too, by his intimacy with the all-perfect father, his Guruji. His guru, his faith, and his fervent study of the law established his categorical understanding of human nature, incapable of nuance, appropriate context recognition, and living within the gray and permeable zones where creativity and compromise go hand in hand. Kakar, actually, Sudhir Kakar, theorized that a wounded sense of self results from a second form, results in a second form of uh, narcissism, what he calls secondary narcissism, following uh, the German analyst Heinz Kohut. In the Indian context, he thinks, Kakar, thinks that larger-than-life heroes such as gurus, film stars, and politicians are put on ex sort of excessively high pedest pedestals where there is intense identification with perfect leaders, which in turn weak nurtures a weakly formed sense of self. I'm not sure I agree with all this, but this point that he makes is interesting. Any threat to the perceived mother or father figure is the gravest of insults. And that leads to this kind of rigorous, machine-like legalism. Moreover, Sudhir Kakar later extended this argument in order to explain communal attachments and the violent boundaries that have been forged in modern times, in particular between Hindus and Muslims. He thinks that there's this narcissistic wound that has been increasingly conjoined to anomie, sort of social dislocation fostered by modern life, as well as the rationalizations and singularities demanded by corporate identities, or what I have called, following Benedict Anderson, the bound or serialized identity structures facilitated by bureaucratic measurement and the subsequent rationalizations of identity these entail with their alienating consequences. In the case of Ramesh, we do not see him calling for preemptive violence or communal discord directed at any corporate identity, but a similar structural logic seemed to be operating. Threats and enemies must be prosecuted in order to protect the, quote, truth and the righteousness more generally. But this righteousness is legalistic and mechanistic, 
much like the boundaries wrought by reformist movements that's, that have sought to attenuate the more fluid and protean cultural boundaries between groups. In the context of contemporary India, doctors I worked with at Nimhan sometimes emphasized that fascistic tendencies were on the rise. I'm going to get controversial, uh, but they said it, not me. Producing or exacerbating, as we have witnessed, fractured or wounded identities. In the case of Ramesh, his latent fractures and possibly, were possibly exacerbated by the former trauma and a profound sense of betrayal and distrust that gushed forth from it. More broadly, the doctors sometimes told me that a fear of difference, of minorities, and a generalized sense of menace from a mysterious other was increasingly conjoined to other clinical symptoms. To conclude, and of course quite provisionally at this point, it is important to remember that the serious and debilitating nature of the symptoms examined cannot be reduced to psychosocial stress or strain caused by modern life. In each and every case, and I only presented a tiny handful here from a much larger book which has dozens of cases, I witnessed significant delusions, hallucinations, cognitive impairments being influenced by a number of organic and non-organic factors. While my focus has been to point to the shared themes as they related to the predicaments of modern life, particularly the social and cultural strains brought on by rationalization and reform. I'm not arguing that mental illness is simply a socio-cultural construct. To do so would romanticize the resistance and suffering that each patient seemed to be enduring with at times catastrophic consequences to themselves and their families as well as to deny the sometimes powerful therapeutic effects of psychiatric care. Well, I aim to understand, what I aim to understand is the continuum of effects associated with the excessive hold of identity, of a singular identity, that creates or is created by legalistic demarcations of right and wrong, self and other, collective and individual. In some cases, we have seen the aspirations of the patient constricted by the reformist and legalistic mindset of modern ethno-religious boundaries. In other cases, we have seen the possessive force of singular, serialized and rigid boundary making, leading to cosmological dualism between good and evil, right and wrong. In both instances, the capacity to live with nuance and creative existence within gray zones of indeterminacy were being constricted. The attenuation of these protean and fluid life worlds conjoined to latent psychiatric vulnerabilities proved disabling, indeed malevolent. In the case of religious reform and purification, we have seen how aspirations, particularly of women, rendered them mad or bad. But I've also observed the emergence of totalizing mindset with a rigid love of the law take root in several clinical encounters. These rigidities in turn are buttressed by the dangers of betrayal, which arguably form the archives of difference that are further damaging to the social fabric within the community, the family, and perhaps the wider society. The key link perhaps between the psychiatric symptoms and the excessive boundaries being generated by the themes of betrayal, the law, the ethno-religious constructs, is a social and perhaps legalistic demand towards some kind of impossible and categorical singularity. These demands, of course, are buttressed by bureaucracy and material relations of power. But against a power-centric reading in which illness is just the thinking of power, the label of power, we take note that the demands for singularity betray insecure origins and is ultimately unstable. As Arjun Napadre has cogently suggested, dead certainty in accounts of social violence paradoxically takes root in moments of greatest social uncertainty. While this paper has focused on religious and quasi-religious themes of malevolence, the ghostly and thwarted aspirations by various types of social betrayal, the larger book project, which witnesses the salience of these themes where the emphasis and illness presentations are different, yet the singular pressures of conformity and normalization overlap with the more cosmological, leaving the stigmas of difference countered by the forces of rebellion and depression. So when I talk about IT burnout and tension, I'm not talking necessarily about the cosmological, but it's that demand for singularity, a kind of uh, entrepreneurial singularity that is also alienating. So there's still that bureaucratic demand towards a singular kind of existence, which is so threatening. Lastly, and one provocation for my colleagues here, is the question of striking a balance between the psychosocial, cultural, and organic understandings of mental illness. Psychiatry, in the best sense, I have observed, is a creatively disruptive force. 
shattering false attachments and phantasmic delusions through a combination of biomedical and social analysis. How to retain this singularly disruptive and anarchic side of psychiatry in a moment when biomedical singularity and standardized diagnostic lexicons, the so-called evidence-based medicine in the ICD and DSM, threaten to create patient disease types out of persons, and in so doing, pathologizing and producing yet another totalizing serialized imaginary, that of the mental health patient. This is something my colleagues are worried about. I'm not the one worried. This isn't just my projection. This is something you all worry about. The totalizing demarcation machine of diagnostic psychiatry as conjoined to the pharmaceutical interests and neoliberal governance and research labs and you know the big research hubs, all of this must be cautiously waded through and avoided to some extent. My sense and my hope and I'm confident is that the doctors here are very well aware of the dangers inherent in an emergent mental health crisis. This kind of discourse, while perhaps real in practical terms, must not become singularized and normalizing within a climate of other economic and political singularities. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Queries? Um, hi, thank you so much for that thought. Um, so while you looked at, say, obsessions and compuls compulsions as uh, a projection of, for example, uh, you know, I mean, there's a certain uh, explanatory sort of, there's a so psychosocial explanatory feel that you sort of provided to certain obsessions and compulsions, uh, rather than how about turning it you know, the up, you know, the other way around, where you look at obsessions and compulsions, you look at you look at study through the lens of obsessions and compulsion, compulsion and what it tells you about society. So looking at a psychiatric patient as a social analyst mm. rather than simply as a doctor, as a social analyst. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think um, there is a kind of language in somatic expression um, and in compulsions, but there's also a risk in that as well, and which is to say it can romanticize that resistance, right? Because the competitive behavior may be non-volitional and, and it's compulsive, and in that sense it may not have much insight, uh, and it may not be able to resist in the way that we like to classically and romantically imagine resistance. That's why I call it a resistance to resistance at one point in the talk, um, which is to say that there is some sort of uh, unspoken um, trauma that is not addressed at all through the patient's enactment of self-harm, for example, banging the head, for example. Um, you know, the sort of Freudian idea of the repetition compulsion was an early statement of it in the 1920s, uh, was that, it, and it's been widely accepted in the trauma literature, that it's an attempt to kind of master the initial trauma, the social trauma of being separated from intimacy and becoming an autonomous being in the world, cut off from that intimacy and union with the mother. And so the entry or the substitute was words, language, symbols, sociality, and so on and so forth. And for the healthy, productive person, you know, in Freudian language, I don't like to use those absolute categories, but uh, is somebody that had learned to make that substitution and to communicate verbally. The person that has compulsive behavior, uh, repetitive compulsive behavior, what we might now call OCD or whatever, is somebody who is unable to articulate that which is unintelligible to themselves. But I agree and I like this idea because there could be aspects of meaning in compulsive behavior that can be unraveled and can be very thought-provoking. Um, so. I'm sort of on the fence with this one. Any others? There's coffee later, but that doesn't prevent you from stimulating your minds or queries now. As a, as a process, the working of psychiatry or neurology in uh, Nimhans, uh, 
as compared to your understanding of how healers work, let's say, in the Nilgiris, would you draw a, a parallel in the kind of roles and illusions of modernity, whether it's a tribal shaman to, again, quote Sudhirikaka's mystics and healers, is there a commonality between the way people's problems are addressed as an, over, as an overarching anthropological construct, not mm. as a procedural process? Mm. That's a wonderful question. Um, I think there is a kind of structural parallel insofar as the doctor in India or the healer in India that I, in my experience, is um, not like quite like the doctor that I've shadowed in the US in that I feel the patient is less willing to step up and challenge the physician. Mm -hmm. So there's that aspect where I think the faith in the doctor, the faith in the psychiatrist, the neurologist, and the faith in the healer is structurally parallel. So there is that power of suggestion. And I think one of the things you all practice is to provide a sense of confidence for patients. Mm -hmm. Whereas in my experience, US doctors often will speak with less confidence and it may have a bad effect in fact, because they will say, well, this may or may not work but we'll try it for two weeks and report. Whereas my experience shadowing here is that there was more confidence expressed to the patient that this effect of the medication or this, of the psychotherapy or CBT, if it was going that direction, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, would be very efficacious. Uh, not with promises of magic solutions, but you know there was this, a real sense of, of confidence. The tribal healers have extreme confidence in, unless they are facing an illness that they haven't seen before. So they speak, and I was just in Chennai last night speaking about this. They are seeing new diseases, new illnesses that they haven't seen before. And they use tension as an example. That word has traveled into the tribal parts of the Nilgiris. In the forest-based communities, people are suffering from tension, the English word. And they will say, I don't really know how to address this. And that may be better treated by allopathy. And maybe you should go to the clinic and, and seek that. And there are many other new illnesses that they call these sort of pudu noi, pudu sangat, sangata, um, that they say, we just have no means to deal with that. So they would refer it uh, to, to, the, um, to the doctor. The other side of this, and the and sort of the more direct way to answer the question that, that uh, Dr. Sanjeev has asked, uh, has to do with um, the kind of efficacy uh, and correlation between the faith in the physician, the support of the surrounding community, and the individual's kind of personal commitment uh, and faith. So you have to have all three aligned in either context here, much more than I would say in the West. That is the faith of the individual patient, client, the doctor and the community that supports that individual forms a kind of tighter nexus of care than I saw in the US. That's, that's sort of an important part of it. The other important part of it, and this echoes uh, Sudhir Kakar's work, and that is to say that there's more emphasis here on harmony, on de-individuation. Uh, in the Western context, this idea that you can walk away from the troubling circumstances that you find yourself in, the predicament that you are in can be overcome. Uh, to know thyself means to overcome your limitations. Whereas, at least in Sudhir Kakar's argument, and I think he's partially right, there is a, a different way of knowing thyself. To know thyself is to know your place in a community, in a family, in a faith, in your uh, social context. And that's very much the case in the Nilgiris, where sorcery and affliction has a functional root in reestablishing egalitarian ties within the community. What's changed, however, is that inequality has come into the communities and what used to be functional and, and sort of brought everyone down, I'm not saying egalitarianism is easy, it's something you have to work on, and that's why you have sorcery to begin with. Sorcery is an attempt to sort of bring people back down to equivalence, which was highly functional for hunter-gatherers societies, so that they have some sense of cohesion and uniformity, and not everyone is off doing their own thing. I want to paint, I want to play my instrument, uh, I don't want to go hunting today. You know, that's not going to be a very good survival mechanism for a small band 
in a forested area. So there's a kind of functional need for that harmonization. But it's not natural and it's not easy, and that's a misconception that people have, that somehow indigenous people have this sort of naturally egalitarian personality. No, it's actually, they have to work very hard at it, and that's why they have elaborate cosmologies and why the ancestors must be pleased and how these kinds of imbalances can, can cause uh, social problems. What's happening now there is that you have a lot of, of an increase in witchcraft and, and sorcery accusations. And I didn't mean to give you this lecture today, but they're sort of spinning out of control. Seveni, uh, other for things, chara, all sorts of black magic uh, is thought to be on the rise and rampant. There's a real sense of malevolence in the community, and it's rooted in modernity there as well. And so there is a common link with what I tried to talk about today. But it's spinning out of control precisely because the socioeconomic conditions have changed rapidly and are irreversible. You cannot go back to subsistence, subsistence economy of hunting and gathering or horticultural production. That is over. It's now all cash economy, wage labor economy, even for tribal people, very minimal self-reliance, and so no way to enforce egalitarianism. But if your neighbor's doing well and I'm not doing well, ah, maybe they've done some black magic. So these kinds of things are commonly seen all over the world when societies are going through rapid social change. And I suspect even in urban areas, a lot of the rise in this malevolence and spiritual haunting is tied in structural inequality. Um, one of the things that I didn't say, but I heard, uh, and I won't say the doctor's name who said it, but they here feel like you're putting a Band-Aid on a, on a, a little Band-Aid on a massive gaping wound. And so those of you who are in the clinic probably feel that sense sometimes. You know that the predicament of the patient is a massive structural predicament, a massive gaping wound caused by the various iniquities and inequalities and stress of today. The corporate identities being a big part of that, but just the major economic stress and frustration. So you put a Band-Aid on it. It's not very satisfying to the physicians who know there's so much more going on, but they can't change society overnight. So, you know, there's, there's a parallel in that sense between the things going on there and here. But I would say even today, with all that inequality and all that sorcery and witchcraft going on in tribal areas, the idea that you go to a healer, and the healers are dying out, literally dying off and not being replaced. If you go to a healer, the healer will tell you to try to minimize conflict and to harmonize and to more or less give up whatever aspiration you have to be different. So there is a kind of disciplinary normalizing element to that healing as well. Similarly here, if you know the patient has got to go back and live with the mother-in-law in the case of the daughter-in-law, you're not going to advise the patient, in my experience watching doctors here, to run away from the mother-in-law, escape. There may be extreme circumstances when that's the only recourse, but generally there will be ways to try to harmonize. Whereas in the West, the first option will always be get out of that situation, divorce your abusive spouse, get away from your oppressive in-laws. Uh, and we have a very sort of atomized and individuated um, you know, problems in our society because we've lost all this social fabric in the US. So in some ways, my, the point I'm trying to make is, you know, leads from what you said last. Uh, you know, you talked about these cases in the context of religion and in some ways family. But now we find that that's already changed. Mm. There is a significant amount of psychological distress related to anomie and isolation yeah. and migration and a whole lot of other things. Yeah. So in some ways, you know, our, can one predict that one is going that way, the kind of way that you, you know, you kind of uh, talked about at the end of your uh, mm. remarks? And in some sense, where, where do you see this leading to? I can tell you, for example, you don't go to the shaman anymore, but people are still in need to go to spiritual gurus, you know, and, and it's a huge thing in India now. Yeah, it's a big industry, so. and it addresses a certain kind of anomie and identity crisis, yeah. I mean, this is one chapter that I focused on a little bit today. I tried to sprinkle in the overview of some of the major things that I observed, but um, there's a whole chapter on kind of the anomie of the youth and um, IT workers, call center workers, those sorts of cases. Uh, where there's extreme burnout and depression and, and loneliness. And um, I mean, you know better than I. I was only here for one year. What did I see in a few OPD hours? Not a, it was more than a few. 
maybe a few hundred OPD hours, but it's still, it's a sampling. But yes, I, I mean, today I really focus on the religion and the cosmological. My thought is, however, that those structural changes that you're describing make people more vulnerable to be prone to totalizing forms of thinking, which is exactly what Max Weber long ago feared, that the disenchantment with modern life, Freud feared this as well, uh, but Max Weber was very prescient and said, look, disenchantment and routinization and bureaucratization, the so-called iron cage of reason, poses a great risk to society because then charismatic leadership will have its triumphant return. When you have people vulnerable, alienated, suffering anomie, then they listen to a Donald Trump, right? I'm showing my political affiliation on my sleeve. Right? Th that's what happens when you have a society that's not healthy, demagogues and ideologues grab. But of course, people also look for l more benign forms of belonging. So they would, in fact, seek. I'm not saying all gurus are bad. No, I mean, there's therapeutic effects in religious healing. Faith-based temples are very powerful. The healers in the Nilgiris give very sound and good advice. And they have real good insight into the human condition. And that's another parallel that I would raise. I, if I hope this came across as sympathetic to my teachers here because, in fact, I have nothing but admiration for their insight and the way that they can conduct in very pressing few moments a very rigorous five to ten minute uh, interview and, and make a judgment which, as I said, cuts like a knife. At, at the very least, it sort of shatters one symptom presentation or one false attachment or one identity or one idea or one symptom in a session. So that's a very powerful and disruptive force. So long as it remains disruptive and, and what I call anarchic and not standardized and routinized by the kind of evidence-based medicine model to the, ex to the, uh, to the uh, denial of all these psychosocial factors and economic factors. Hi. Um I missed uh, the first half, uh, sorry about that, um, but I just wanted to uh, go back to a thought that you uh, shared while answering one to one of the questions was around the patient um, therapist or the care worker relationship and where I you see in India that there is more confidence that a, a therapist is able to display to a patient when they're providing some kind of uh, solution option or treatment versus the US and what you've seen this may not work or that may not work. I'm not sure I'm hearing. Is the mic working? Uh, <laughs> Can you say again into the mic a little louder? Sure. Sorry. No, I was referring to one of the things that you shared about your observations uh, with respect to patterns you've seen in the patient and uh, the care provider relationship and how much the, the varying levels of confidence that a care provider is able to showcase in India versus the US. and. I was thinking uh, on, I was curious to know, and I know very little about the subject in general, is if gender plays as a factor in this, and if, if, um, if when we are looking at treating women, for instance, and if the, care, if the therapist or the psychiatrist is, is a man versus a woman, um, how are they able to, if the solution um, kind of like the tree options or the ways they try to explain the problem, is connected to their uh, ability to connect with the cultural, social, structural context from where the problem that a person is coming with may be very gender specific. So are there any differences when, which you observe with respect to the gender of the, uh, of the doctor or the therapist? It's a great question and one I should have thought more about. Um, I was surprised at how sensitive uh, male doctors were to the question of gender. But I think in the intake interviews, sometimes people are specifically sent to a particular doctor. In other words, when the resident or fellow is doing the intake, um, they may identify which doctor could best address those concerns. And so there may be a clinical psychologist who specializes in you know one area before the psychiatrist is, is uh, addressing that. Um, and in fact, I, I do recall cases where um, the examining or the OPD physician would, um, you know, send a referral because they thought this could be better addressed by, by a woman or by another doctor who has specialized training in that area. Um, but in general, my impression, for what it's worth, is that the, the doctors that I shadowed are very um, 
well versed in uh, a number of uh, gender and family dynamic based models of understanding mental health. And so they're not, uh, at least maybe it's because I was really shadowing the senior doctors and what they say, and not to pick on the, the students and residents and fellows, but they, they worry that that is the art of psychiatry getting diluted by a kind of neuro specialization. So for example, in neurology today, you have, uh, this is a bit off the psychiatric topic, but you have people that specialize just in reading EEG and that's all they do. And they could never talk to a person and get a kind of picture of a symptom presentation. And in psychiatry, you could have folks who are, you know, becoming quite specialized in one particular, maybe very important, but very specialized type of training, which is facilitated by research grants, that is facilitated by uh, a kind of career trajectory to pursue that specialized interest. But it may come at the expense of a more well-rounded well uh, sense of of interpersonal care and dynamics and understanding uh, other modes of therapy themselves. So a clinical psychiatrist here may not be able to conduct extensive psychotherapy with a patient due to the constraints of OPD, but they should be trained, the doctors that I met told me, they should understand what those principles are so they could kind of have a more holistic sense of, of practice. And that was their fear that they expressed to me about the future, whether that can be retained. Thank you, Andrew. I'll leave Dr. Prasima to your vote of thanks. You know, Andrew, what it reminded me of was something that we, when we were students, uh, our uh, head of the department, Professor Channa Basavana, uh, you know, you, I mean, I think there was a very nice, uh, you know, a joint um, uh, discussion with the psychiatrist, psychologist, and psychiatric social worker actually sitting together in one room. And at that time, I remember one of the concerns was patients taking overdoses of amitriptyline. We had one patient who committed, uh, who attempted suicide with an overdose of amitriptyline. And then there was a lot of concern saying, you know, that we shouldn't be prescribing more than a week or two of amitriptyline. There was such a kind of uh, reaction from all the women who were attending the OPD. These were young or middle-aged women who came out, who were able to come out only once in about two months. And the only panacea for all their distress was that amitriptyline. So I, I mean, when you said about, you know, pills being a fix, it, it's a complete, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, flip that these were women who did not have any other way of resolving the kind of psychosocial adversities that you described in their, in their homes and therefore looked to not only to coming and seeing the doctor but also getting that pill. And I, I think all of you will realize in your lifetime that, uh, you know, uh, Andrew presented several examples of both of psychotic disorders and persons who came with conversion and other kind of disorders and how there is such a larger context to it. And I think sometimes psychiatrists, it's said that when you have a group of people in a room, you can identify a psychiatrist because uh, while all the other people are looking at an attractive person coming into the room, the psychiatrist is looking at them. And now we have an anthropo anth anthropologist who's not, not only looking at everybody else, but the psychiatrist as well. So I think it, it felt interesting to be under the lens for a bit and actually see the way we kind of, you know, work in our environments. Uh, maybe some of the things that we do uh, reasonably well in the circumstances, but then a lot of things we possibly don't do in the circumstances. And I think that's where it's going to be very insightful to read your book, and we all look forward to it. Thank you very much.